Coming up on Arirang News, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says the U.S. government could find itself in a crisis by mid-October, unable to pay its creditors if lawmakers don't raise the debt ceiling. Congress still deadlocked on the issue with just weeks to go. Data show the number of babies born in South Korea in July was the lowest for the month of July on record. New marriages also at an all-time low, a trend exacerbated by the pandemic. And taking over as the leader of Japan's ruling party and set to succeed Yoshihide Suga as prime minister will be the former foreign minister Fumio Kishida, who won a close race today in a party vote. It's 5 o'clock p.m. here in Seoul. Thank you for joining us on Arirang News. I'm Devin Whiting. We start with the, an issue that's got investors around the world alarmed this week. U.S. lawmakers are deadlocked on raising the amount the government can borrow. And Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says that if the debt ceiling is not raised, then the government could be unable to make its interest payments by mid-October, a scenario that would precipitate a crisis. Min Soo Kyun reports. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has warned that the nation will likely run out of money within three weeks unless Congress acts to avoid serious harm to the economy. She said that the Treasury Department will be left with very limited resources and will likely exhaust its extraordinary measures if Congress fails to raise or suspend the debt limit by October 18. Speaking at a Senate hearing on Tuesday, Yellen expressed her deep concern over the looming debt ceiling. And if the debt ceiling were not raised, I think there would be a financial crisis and a calamity. And absolutely, it's true that the interest payments on the government debt would increase. Yellen also cautioned that it was uncertain whether the Treasury would be able to meet the nation's financial commitments after that date. Her remarks come a day after Senate Republicans blocked a bill that would fund the government and suspend the U.S. borrowing limit to pay for previously incurred government spending. She said that failure to clinch a deal by mid-October would lead to the first default in U.S. history, one that would be disastrous for the American economy and global financial markets. The Treasury had already enacted extraordinary measures to keep government funds flowing after the debt ceiling was reached over the summer. But those measures will run out in about three weeks' time, according to Yellen. The projections from the U.S. Treasury Secretary raise concern that Washington could default on its debt in a matter of weeks if lawmakers fail to act over crucial funding measures. Min Suk Kyun, Arirang News. New data show that in 2020, exports were a bigger contributor to South Korea's economic growth than they have been in three years. According to the Korea International Trade Association, more than 23 percent of South Korea's GDP came from the added value created by exports, mainly high-value products like chips and biohealth products. Last year, the economy actually shrank by nine-tenths of a percent, but exports cushioned that decline by 0.6 percentage points. South Korea has taken action in response to a new tariff enacted by the U.K. this July. The Trade Ministry has informed the WTO that it could suspend its own tariff concessions to Britain to counter the U.K. safeguard measures on Korean steel. This means Seoul could impose tariffs on U.K. goods to make up for the damage. Britain is charging a 25 percent tariff on imported steel products above its quotas for three years until June 2024. South Korea's Hyundai Motor has launched a new mini SUV to diversify its lineup in the domestic market. It's called the Casper, and it's for sale online starting today at a price of 14 million won, or about 12,000 U.S. dollars. This is not only the first time Hyundai's released a mini SUV, it's also the first time it's sold a car exclusively online. So far, pre-orders have been placed for 25,000 units, which is more than double the 12,000 the company had planned to make this year. One of those orders is apparently from President Moon, who reportedly plans to drive it once he's retired. The number of births in South Korea continues to decline. Data show in July it was the lowest ever figure for that month. New marriages also at a record low, with many people delaying life plans because of the pandemic. Om Ji-young has more. 
more and more couples in South Korea are not having kids. Hwang Seung-hwa, who has been married for five years, is one of many who say children are not part of their plans. If I get pregnant and raise my child, I could lose my job. It could be economically damaging. The number of births in South Korea has fallen to an all-time low for the month of July. According to Statistics Korea, there were around 22,300 births in July this year. That's a decline of around 3 percent compared to a year earlier, and the number of births has now been declining on year for 68 months in a row. The number of new marriages also saw a record low for the month of July, standing at around 15,700. This was down around 8 percent compared to the same month of the previous year. Statistics Korea says the number of new marriages has been declining since 2012. Fewer people in their 20s and 30s are getting married, and the pandemic also contributed to the drop in new marriages, as many couples delayed their weddings. This has led to the drop in births. Meanwhile, the number of deaths in July stood at roughly 25,700, the highest for the month of July since records began. It increased by around 7 percent on year. In 2025, South Korea is to become a super-aged society where those over the age of 65 account for 20 percent of the country's population. And already there are 1.6 million over 65s who live alone. The official said the increasing number of deaths is due to the aging society, but that a small portion of the increase last month was due to COVID-19 and the unusually hot weather. Om Jiyong, Arirang News. With consumer prices rising, the South Korean government is going to freeze the costs of some public utilities and services until the end of the year. The decision was announced Wednesday by Vice Finance Minister Lee Ok Won. Already, some bills are set to increase, like for electricity, but aside from those, the vice minister said that other rates set by the central government will not change, like train fares and highway tolls. More foreign nationals are buying houses in South Korea. Between 2017 and 2019, the number of homes bought by foreigners went up more than 30 percent. That's according to data from the National Tax Service. It also gave a breakdown by nationality, looking at a period of about three and a half years starting 2017. Roughly 40 percent of homes bought by foreigners were bought by citizens of China. They spent roughly 2.7 billion U.S. dollars. Americans were the second largest group, mostly buying apartments, in total worth around $1.8 billion. Among foreign buyers, Americans accounted for almost 30 percent of them. China is facing a new threat, an energy shortage, a crisis even. With fuel prices high and a lack of coal in particular, factories are having to shut down, and how some households have no electricity. Another issue China is dealing with right now is the debt crisis at Evergrande, the real estate conglomerate, now on the verge of default, which if it happens would have ripple effects around the world. To take a closer look at both of these issues, today we have in the studio our very own Zhang Taehan. Good to see you, uh, Taehyun. Good afternoon, Devin. Well, uh, let's start with the power outages in China. Uh, this seems highly unusual and uh, a big deal for an industrial country like China. What's the situation overall? Mm -hmm. Well, China is experiencing an energy crisis and it's starting to affect people's daily lives, adding to the risk of an economic slowdown. There have been blackouts in some of China's northern provinces and even traffic lights have been turned off. Local media say it's because of the lack of electricity since coal and natural gas cost too much. China is highly dependent on coal for power, accounting for more than 60 percent of the country's electricity generation. 
The problem is that China stopped importing coal from Australia last year, amid a political disagreement between the two countries. That's why the price has spiked by 50 percent, meaning that power plants make a loss when generating electricity. And this has led to a power outage. President Xi Jinping previously announced plans to decarbonize the economy by 2060 and has capped the growth of coal mining. Demand for coal from factories in China spiked, but utilities were unable to buy enough fuel after the price soared. So this is affecting ordinary people in their daily lives. It's uh, connected to international relations, as you said. And uh, China has been called the factory of the world, so it needs this power. It's, a, it's an industrial powerhouse. Uh, so if, if they don't have electricity in China, this would have an impact not only there, but around the world. Yes, that's right. So the power outage is starting to affect various industries, with several provinces ordering factories to stop operations. Even some Apple and Tesla suppliers have suspended production to follow the tighter energy consumption policies, putting supply chains at risk amid rising demand for electronic goods. The Chinese operations of South Korea's steel giant, POSCO, have also been affected. POSCO was forced to stop operating and will resume in early October. 16 out of 22 provinces cannot use power, so unless China and Australia solve their conflict, this situation could be prolonged. Goldman Sachs cut its forecast for China to 7.8 percent, down from 8.2. The banking giant says the energy crisis poses significant downside pressures and affects 44 percent of China's industrial activity. Well, Taehyun, let's move on to the other big issue that's uh, affecting China right now, a crisis, really, uh, the possible collapse of uh, the real estate giant Evergrande. What's the overall situation there? Okay, so Evergrande is one of China's largest real estate companies and also has interest in other sectors, but its debts snowballed as it borrowed to finance its multiple pursuits. The group has more than 300 billion U.S. dollars of liabilities. And the issue. Right. The issue there, yeah. uh, of course, being that $300 billion, it's got to make interest payments on that. And if they're not able to, as they were not able to last week, then uh, they could face a default. They're in a grace period right now. But uh, that would be a massive deal if they were to default. What's the company doing to get these payments back on track? Okay. So it was announced today that Evergrande will raise over one and a half billion U.S. dollars by offloading part of Shenzhen Bank in an attempt to meet its enormous financial obligations. Evergrande says it will sell a 19.93 percent stake in the bank it runs to a state-owned enterprise. The company admits its liquidity crunch has adversely affected the bank, and selling part of it will stabilize the bank's operations. Evergrande has another $47.5 million interest payment due on September 29th. Yes, that's today. But it remains to be seen if the firm has the funds at hand. The Chinese real estate conglomerate reportedly missed one payment deadline last week. Right. And so now they're in the grace period. Uh, and some are talking about a possible Lehman Brothers style uh, issue like we saw uh, back at the financial crisis uh, that started in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, others are saying, though, that the Chinese government will step in and bail out Evergrande, though uh, we might not have seen a clear sign of that yet. Uh, tell us more about that, though. Of course. So the Chinese authorities are watching the situation, but have not given a clear sign that they're going to intervene. Let's take a listen to an expert for some more insight. So I would like to clarify that China is already intervening. Uh, Evergrande is not uh, anymore a company that can take uh, decisions. We're not going to see a collapse of the financial sector in China. It's neither a demolition. Because this company, maybe with a different name, maybe you know, cut in pieces, is going to continue to operate by finalizing those units. And she added that those units may be incorporated through local government's state-owned developers to reduce the systemic risks. Right. Well, fascinating report, Tehana. Depending on how the situation unfolds, we'll have to uh, keep, have you keep us up <laughs> to date on it. So appreciate the reporting today. My pleasure, Devin.
In Japan, former Foreign Minister Fumio Kishida has won the leadership race in the ruling Liberal Democratic Party, and he's set to become this country's 100th Prime Minister. With the latest, uh, we connect live to Arirang's Lee Kyung-un. Kyung uh, Kishida won over the country's uh, vaccine minister, Taro Kono, in a runoff. That's right, Devin. The first round of voting began at 1 p.m. when Japan's ruling LDP held its internal election to choose its new leader, who will effectively become the new prime minister as the party holds the majority in parliament. Four candidates ran for the election, but it was mainly a two-way race between ex-foreign minister Fumio Kishida and vaccine minister Taro Kono. The 382 party members get one vote, with the remaining 382 ballots split among 47 prefecture chapters where the party's 1.1 million rank-and-file members also get a say. Kishida won 256 votes and Kuna scored one less. The race was too close to call since Kishida had stronger support from party members in parliament, while Kono is more popular with the party's rank-and-file. Since nobody got a majority in the first round, the election went on to a runoff among the top two contenders. For the second round, the 47 prefectures just got one vote each, meaning just 429 votes were at stake. And Kishida won 257 ballots, defeating Kona again, who scored 170. Kishida becoming the new LDP leader will be replacing the outgoing prime minister, Yoshihide Suga. The new leadership, however, is not likely to trigger a huge shift in Japan's policies. Back to you, Devin. All right. Lee kyung with the latest on the leadership change in Japan. Thank you for that. Now, the latest on the coronavirus situation in South Korea. The country on Wednesday reported its second highest daily number of cases to date at 2,885. Of those, 77 percent were in the greater Seoul area. The previous all-time high was about a week ago at nearly 3,300. There's been a rise in breakthrough infections, meaning those in people who've been fully vaccinated. In the last week, there have been almost 1,900 such cases. In total, more than 7,700 breakthrough infections have been reported so far. And though the virus is still spreading at a relatively high rate, the effect of the vaccines is becoming clear in terms of preventing deaths. The fatality rate, which had last December been at 2.7 percent, came down in August to 0.35 percent. And now to North Korea. The regime claims that the projectile it fired into the East Sea on Tuesday was a newly developed hypersonic missile. Also Tuesday, the North convened its Supreme People's Assembly to discuss domestic issues with no message either for South Korea or the United States. Payunji has this report. North Korea said on Wednesday that it has developed a hypersonic missile and confirmed that it had conducted its first test launch on Tuesday. The regime's Korea Central News Agency reported that it had fired a Hwasong-8 missile from Doyangri, Rongnim County of Chagangdo Province. The state-run media also said the test launch confirms the stability of its missile fuel ampule, which has been used for the first time. This fuel ampule appears to be referring to a container of liquid fuel. Unlike conventional missiles that need a fuel injection before firing, this type of fuel ampule can reduce the preparation time for a missile launch and have the weapon ready for use almost as fast as a solid fuel missile. The KCNA said that Park jong chun a member of the Presidium of the Politburo of the Ruling Workers' Party, guided the launch. But North Korean leader Kim Jong-un did not attend the firing. The North has fired a total of six missiles this year, but Kim Jong-un did not attend any of them. This appears to be because these new types of missiles are still in their development stage. On Tuesday, the regime also held its Supreme People's Assembly. On the first day of the meeting on Tuesday, it did not issue any message to Seoul or Washington and mostly focused on economic and other domestic matters. According to KCNA, laws on youth education and modifications to the National Economic Plan were discussed at the meeting, without leader Kim Jong-un. At the meeting on Wednesday, the North plans to discuss the issue of renaming Air Korea Administration to State Air Administration. Air Korea is the North national flag carrier. This is the second Supreme People's Assembly held this year. It was last held in January. Arirang News. 
A senior U.S. diplomat says the Biden administration wants to meet with North Korea without preconditions to discuss the intentions and concerns of both sides and to look for ways to make progress. This was Kin Moy, the principal deputy assistant secretary of state for East Asian and Pacific Affairs. He was speaking Tuesday in a webinar hosted by the Korea Foundation and the Atlantic Council. He also said the U.S. is open to confidence building measures with the North. The regime, however, has ignored all such overtures from the U.S. since President Biden took office in January. South Korea's top nuclear envoy, No Gyu Duck, is on his way to Indonesia to meet with his American counterpart, Sung Kim, about the latest developments on the Korean peninsula. Just before leaving on Wednesday, he told reporters that they will discuss ways to address issues regarding the North's recent missile launches and the regime's recent statements. He also said they'll discuss President Moon's recent proposal of declaring a formal end to the Korean War. The two envoys will meet in Jakarta on Thursday. They last met about two weeks ago in Tokyo. Senior defense officials from South Korea and the U.S. met in Seoul on Monday and Tuesday for talks on North Korea and ways to shore up their joint defense posture. They discussed the North's recent missile launches and agreed to ensure the alliance remains the linchpin of peace and security on the Korean peninsula. Han sung reports. After two days of talks, senior defense officials of South Korea and the U.S., agreed to explore enhancements to the alliance's defense posture to account for omnidirectional threats. That's according to a joint statement at the conclusion of the 20th Korea-U.S. Integrated Defense Dialogue in Seoul on Tuesday, where the two sides also discussed North Korea's recent missile launches. The South Korean and U.S. delegations, led by Deputy Minister for National Defense Policy Kim man gi and Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for East Asia, Siddharth Mohandas, respectively, however, still underscored the importance of diplomacy and the resumption of dialogue to address these changes. During the Security Policy Initiative, Kim and Mohandas lauded the ratification of the Special Measures Agreement as a critical achievement in maintaining the alliance and ensuring the steady stationing of U.S. forces in Korea. Meanwhile, the Deterrence Strategy Committee saw officials participate in tabletop exercises to review measures to deter and respond to North Korea's threats, including nuclear, WMD, and missiles. The outcomes from the tabletop exercises will contribute to shaping this whole Washington-tailored deterrence strategy. Identifying North Korea's nuclear, WMD, and missiles threats amid a dynamic regional security environment, the U.S. also pledged to utilize the full range of its capabilities to provide extended deterrence, while South Korea pledged to continue developing its military's nuclear and WMD response systems. Launched in 2011, the Korea-U.S. Integrated Defense Dialogue is a regular defense meeting between Seoul and Washington that integrates a set of consultative mechanisms, such as the Deterrent Strategy Committee and the Security Policy Initiative. Based on the outcomes from this year's meeting, the two sides will continue their efforts to achieve meaningful progress at the 53rd Security Consultative Meeting to be hosted in Seoul in November this year. Han sung Arirang News. And South Korea's Minister of Unification, Lee in young said on Wednesday that to improve relations with North Korea, three things need to be taken care of. Denuclearization, building a peace regime, and resuming dialogue. Speaking to reporters at Incheon International Airport before leaving for Europe, he urged the North to return to talks. Regarding the recent proposal of declaring a formal end to the Korean War, he said it would be a, quote, useful and meaningful step towards peace and cooperation. During E's six-day trip to Europe, he'll go to Belgium, Sweden and Germany to seek European support for building peace. And in other news, the K-pop stars BTS have been number one for longer than any other artist in the past year on Billboard's new Global 200 chart, the version that does not include the U.S. That's according to a report released Tuesday by Billboard and MRC Data. The chart counts audio and video streams and download sales. 
In the new chart's first year, BTS have been number one for 15 weeks in total since last September. Their hits in that time include Dynamite, Butter, Life Goes On, and Permission to Dance. For the Global 200 chart that does include the U.S., they've been at number one for the second longest time, following only the American singer Olivia Rodrigo. And that brings us to the end of this newscast. Thank you for watching. More live news coming your way at 7 p.m. Korea time.